Hello and welcome to this evening's episode of The Watchdog. My name is Vuyam Volko and on the show this evening... We are confronted with unavoidable administrative processes which resulted in the delay. The Department of Military Veterans has failed to meet its December deadline to distribute outstanding pension funds to veterans. Deputy Minister Tabang Makwetla is in studio to tell us why. It's been a rough year for suspended public protector Busisiwe Mkwebane and as 2022 draws to a close, she joins me to reflect on the year that was. The Watchdog starts now. An announcement that will not go down well with the military veterans the Department of Defense and Military Veterans has considered that it will not meet the December deadline to pay funds to the veterans. Earlier this year, Deputy President David Mabuza said there was a 37 million rand set aside for this purpose. But Deputy Minister of Defense and Military Veterans, Tabang Makwetla, says that due to unforeseen administrative issues, the December deadline will not be met. In the process of the implementation of this decision, we are confronted with unavoidable administrative processes which resulted in the delay in the payment of the pension benefits. One of these was the requirement that the draft pension regulations and the pension benefit access forms should be tabled in Parliament first. The department has meanwhile called on all the veterans who are said to benefit from the allocated pension fund by government to refrain from trying to take advantage of this situation and attempt to defraud the department. For now, government will look at a social relief distress grant of 1,250 for the veterans. As people keep on trying to come in, we, we identify a lot of frauds coming into the systems and one looks and says, but your age, it can't be that you, 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 you qualify. When we look at beneficiaries, all countries look at the first generation. And if it is the second generation, it must be that the parents of this grandchild who then became the responsibility and was adopted by the military really became now the, a proper dependent and it can be proven. It would seem it's going to be a steep hill for these military veterans this December. Until such a time the department sorts out all its administrative challenges, they will have to wait and see. Abongile Dumago, SABC News, Pretoria. Joining me in studio is the Deputy Minister of the Department of Military Veterans, Tabang Makwetla, to talk about progress on the implementation of those military veterans' pension benefits. Good evening, Deputy Minister. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, good evening, Fuyo, and thanks for having us on your program. Uh, I think the, 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 the big issue, or perhaps central issue here, is why you had to wait until now when it was time for implementation um, to come out and say, we've been having, we've been having problems. Could, could, I mean, weren't these problems identified much earlier? <clears throat> well, well, let me just explain that uh, the time for implementation of this military veterans pension was actually the 1st of April this year. Um, <clears throat> The decision to have this pension paid out was taken by the PTT, the presidential task team, last year. And uh, according to engagements with the department, they were going to be able to pay it from the beginning of this financial year in April. One thing led to the other as far as preparations administratively to have the pension paid out. <clears throat> when uh, it was clear that the capacity does not uh, you know, exist in-house, the department then approached the, the uh, government uh, pensions administration agency, uh, GIPA, uh, to assist. And GIPA welcomed the request and they started putting you know, systems in place, the ICT, 
uh, and all other administrative measures. Um, at that time when that was happening, um, what uh, the department was oblivious of was the need to table regulations in parliament and according to the stipulations in the act, 30 days before they are published. Um, <clears throat> we thought as the presidential task team uh, that uh, with all those glitches, notwithstanding, we should uh, do everything short of breaking the rules to have the pension paid out in December. Uh, but as uh, <clears throat> we now know, the regulations were only tabled, were only ready to be tabled in Parliament at the beginning of December of this month. Uh, so what it means is that we are on that waiting period of 30 days, early in January, we'll start then processing applications for this uh, pension. So someone slept on the job? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, some of the awareness of, 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 of uh, administrative law that at times management uh, may actually not be of okay with. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's where... The <laughs> but I mean, the, the, I mean the, your, your officials, our uh, minister, should have been aware that, uh, I mean, to process something like this, these are the steps that you need to, um, you need, you need to follow. I mean, can't discover when you have to actually do um, um, this thing, pay this money, is that, oops, there's a step that we didn't follow. Well, I mean, then there should be consequences for someone like that. Uh, that's true. Uh, procedurally, there should be consequences. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that is uh, now and again what uh, in this business you will encounter with departments. Uh, uh, and of course, with the Department of Military Veterans, the other, you know, disadvantage is that, uh, you know, <clears throat> it has vacancies in very critical, you know, divisions of the department, and one of those is the legal department. So there were no in-house legal minds to help guide the process for them, uh, such that uh, things uh, were, were done, you know, uh, on time and efficiently. So, so you're saying it's not a question of someone or a person who slept on the job, but that person is not there. That person doesn't exist, who would have had to do the necessary um, um, things. Is that what that, you say? Yeah, that's, uh, that's factually the truth about uh, what uh, is behind the, the lapse of the department with respect to this particular you know, instance. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, I mean, the minister spoke there about a whole host of other challenges where, uh, you know, people's, uh, shall we call them, credentials or information um, suggesting that, I mean, there may have been people who were trying to, uh, you know, fluke the system um, or lay claims that they are not um, uh, entitled to. Have you... Do you have another set of problems that also contributed to um, this money not being paid? No, the <clears throat> delay in the paying out of this pension was uh, all these years as a result of the limited financial resources dedicated to the department. Um, the benefit, the pension benefit is part of the benefits military veterans are entitled to in accordance to the act of 2011. So we're talking a whole decade since this policy was introduced, but government was unable to honor it because mm -hmm. the budget of the Department of Military Veterans did not allow for you know, the space to have this pension implemented. Mm -hmm. It is the presidential task team's in intervention that made it possible. And that is why you know, the establishment of the task team by the president is, uh, should be appreciated because without that uh, extraordinary political intervention in the normal course of things, of work, the ministry on its own may not have been able to prevail over Treasury to say, please do uh, 
make sure that uh, you know we make this money pro I mean, available. But in terms of uh, selection process, qualifying uh, criteria, and all this, you've never had problems uh, there. No. no. In other words, people coming forward claiming uh, to be military veterans when they were when they were not. Well, with respect to people who come forward to claim this uh, uh, support in government, uh, you do encounter uh, now and again, in, not only in relation to this, you know, benefit, but generally, you do encounter, you know, cases where, you know, people try their luck to try and beat the system to come into the pool of, uh, people, of those who must benefit. Um, and that is why the verification task team, the verification panel of DMV has been, you know, hard at work since the PTT re-established it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it is not only verifying by looking at the new applicants, but we are also cleaning that database to see if uh, they may, uh, there are no cases of uh, undeserving, fraudulent, you know, people who are on our database. So it's a verification and cleaning of the database that's going on. And from uh, GAPA, have you re gotten any feedback as to, uh, I mean, other problems that may arise? Have they red flagged anything? Or uh, are you saying that once the 30 days is over, you don't foresee any other problem, except you'll just be able to pay and then the rest will be history? Yes, that is indeed exactly the situation. Uh, a very detailed, you know, uh, contractual agreement has been signed between the D Department of Military Veterans and GIPA. Uh, we looked at it, we went through it, it's very detailed. Uh, so everything uh, seemed to be in place and uh, we are very much confident that uh, come, you know, the end of this 30 days, we'll commence to process and roll. And there'll be no stories. There'll be no stories. <laughs> but uh, when there are, if, if there mm, are stories, mm. there are always measures to have these stories, uh, you know, you know mm. dealt with, corrected, as mm. you said. But are you guaranteed now that there won't be a stage sometime in the future where someone turns around and says, actually, this is not sustainable. We're not going to have um, this, 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 this money uh, again to give to these um, veterans? No, it, it definitely not, because uh, uh, the plans going forward as far as uh, the carry through uh, in the department's budgets has been worked out. Uh, as you, from the clip, uh, said, we have uh, 37 million put aside for the takeoff of this pension in this financial year. And across the MTEF period, it is going to be increasing that budget with about uh, uh, 6 million. Um, so we are very confident that we'll be able to to pay that budget. So it's now, I mean, going forward, it's, it's, it's going to be budgeted for no yes. new stories about uh, unavailability yes. of funds. And That's right. In the next financial year, for instance, there is 103 million that has been set aside for that. The year following, it's 109 million. The year after, it's 115. On an annual basis, mm -hmm. there'll be a six million mm -hmm. increase to this budget. Mm -hmm. And we think the way it has been, you know, scoped mm -hmm. uh, as far as the numbers involved and the other factors that has to be, you know, calculated, uh, we are relatively... Now, the, the grant now in the interim, how is that going to be administered and what should these veterans do to access that? The grant, uh, Vuyo, it's uh, one of the um, areas where the department's performance was very, you know, really disappointing. Because uh, when the social relief of this stress grant, the 350 rands was introduced, we were clear that uh, the Department of Military Veterans, unlike the Department of Social Development, it has on its database people who are bona fide, genuine recipients of this social relief of distress grant. And in the D 
discussions we had with their representatives of these military veterans after they had marched mm -hmm. uh, on the, uh, the union buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually thought that uh, we will, in the interim, whilst preparing, uh, putting things in place for a pension to be paid out, we will make sure that the social relief of distress grant will be paid out because it was an easy to do. And uh, the department even came up with a budget to top up that 350 uh, uh, rents with about 850, you know, rents. Um, but that budget, that money ended up not being used simply because the administrative capacity of the department could not live up to expectations. And those are the issues that we have uh, challenges with. The department has a challenge in that uh, it does not have sufficient warm bodies. The workforce the department is employing uh, for the work that it must do is not sufficient, but that is a function of the overall budget dedicated to the department in relation to employee compensation. Uh, so you're having a very modest department, uh, and as a result, you don't always have the people you need for a whole range of other things that a department normally should be able to do. So this is just an example of, uh, you know, how not fit for purpose is the department's capacity at the moment as far as uh, its, uh, its mission is concerned. The picture you're painting, David Mesa, is quite scary. Sounds like this department is uh, dysfunctional. No, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not saying the department is dysfunctional. No, I'm saying I'm it saying sounds like, I mean, when you, when you think about it, I mean... Uh, it's undercapacitated. The department is undercapacitated. And of course, where there are no capacities, of course, it means it cannot function the way it should function. But, you know, at times dysfunctional can denote, you know, other. But, know. but it is. I mean, I'm trying to think of the military veteran who was expecting this. Uh, I mean, the situation has been desperate over the past couple of years of, uh, uh, I mean, especially during uh, uh, COVID. Now, for people to be denied, you know, something that is there, that's available, you know, that they should be given is, is it's, it's, it's inexcusable. Yes. Indeed, it is inexcusable. And it is for that reason that the presidential task team this time around put pressure on the department that uh, December, come December, end of this year, this pension must be paid out. And uh, we were ready to break every obstacle on the way to get it paid out in December, but still uh, it didn't work out. And uh, we're just happy that uh, we're now talking weeks down the line, there will be an activation of this uh, uh, pension. Well, let's go. I mean, let's talk about something, something, something else. I mean, while we were at the um, ANC conference, the story broke out that um, you, the SNDF, is now going to help um, at uh, at ESCOM. There are going to, I mean, ten members of the SNDF will go to each of the uh, um, stations that were that were that were listed, but. There was confusion as to sort of the type of personnel that is going to be sent um, to um, these uh, power stations and what it is exactly um, that they are expected to do. Are you any clearer? Um, look, um, uh, sentries uh, in their responsibilities their duties would be duties that can, performed, can be performed by any soldier with, in spite of or despite uh, the specialization, outside of the specialization that soldiers normally have. If we are to put a static protection of infrastructure, any soldier would be able to provide the requisite uh, skill for that purpose. So, guarding of uh, these power stations. Uh, it's, uh, it's 
at the level in relation to the challenges skills wise to the military it is really at an entry level mm-hmm. um, what is important of course is that uh, uh, everything gets efficiently done when there is accurate information about what is it we are dealing with I'm so, I'm so not otherwise a uh, minister because if and this is what we kept uh, discussing or debating on, on, on the day. Are we talking about 10 ordinary soldiers for each of the listed um, uh, power stations who are going to stand at the gate the way uh, your security guards do? Is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about people who have specialized skills? Because the problems that were identified, it's like coal that's mixed with stones, you know, that goes, you know, in and out of these stations. We're talking about people who are stealing um, spares at these uh, uh, power stations. Now, I mean, if it's a duty that can be performed by any, uh, I mean, it, it would, it suggests to one that you need people with specialized skills you know, it has to be, one would imagine, intelligence-driven. Uh, because otherwise, how else? I mean, because these are people, the people who are stealing or who are sabotaging, um, you know, ESCOM, uh, know the system very well. So they're not going to present themselves at the gate with the stolen stuff. They clearly have, uh, are skilled in what, in, what, in what they're doing. They know the system um, in and out. Now, a soldier who then arrives, gun or machine gun in hand standing at the gate may not be able to actually uh, uh, deal with the with the problems that have been identified well the question you are raising uh, for you unavoidably uh, calls for more information about Mm -hmm. exactly what information was received Mm -hmm. and unfortunately uh, I would uh, be compromising Mm. the work of the security forces if I may now want to go into those details Mm. Um, some of the details which I may actually not know Uh, but that is the nature of uh, of security work Uh, for it to to succeed it is only those limited uh, involved in actually making sure that there are no bridges who know what is it that uh, that they are looking for so what i'm saying is that uh, yes we have sent the soldiers to provide security the details over physically seeing soldiers at those installations are details which uh, of course cannot be disclosed publicly okay well let's hope that uh, I mean, it, it isn't that, you know, I mean, the deployment there is going to make a, a, a difference. As I say, I mean, the details have been sketchy and, um, you know, a lot of things could not be, you know, um, um, explained. But thank you very much for coming through, uh, Deputy Minister. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for the invitation, Deputy thank Minister um, of Military Veterans. Um, after this uh, short ad break, I'm speaking to suspended public protector Busiwa Mkwabane as the year draws to a close. She has spent the better part of this year fighting to keep her job after President Cyril Ramaphosa in June suspended her. The suspension came after Parliament instituted an inquiry uh, to look into her fitness to hold office, the first head of a Chapter 9 institution to go through such a process. Advocate Wusuwa Mkwebane joins us on the line to reflect on what was perhaps the most eventful and testing year of her professional life. Advocate, good evening. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening, Vuyo, and good evening to your viewers and listeners. And thank you so much for inviting me. Am I correct in thinking that 2022 was perhaps 
the toughest of your entire professional life? <laughs> I would say yes, one of the toughest because of the suspension, but um, for the past six years has been a very bumpy um, ride, but uh, we've managed until this far um, to uh, keep on going on. I mean, you were suspended on the 9th of June, um, a day after announcing an investigation into President Cyril Ramaphosa's Palapala farm robbery matter. Uh, in your heart of hearts, though, um, do you honestly believe that the investigation was the reason you were suspended? Um, yes, Vuyo, I must indicate that. Uh, remember, we've been um, showing and arguing, even in court and in our court papers, showing that um, the engagements between my legal team and the president's legal team and the letters which were written by the speaker, Mapisa Ngagula, to uh, the president in March uh, 2022, and nothing transpired or happened. But then the trigger indeed definitely was um, the 31 questions which I have sent to the president and as well the court judgment of the 9th of September 2022. It was very clear because it dealt in detail on um, the issue of the vindictiveness and uh, the way that the president was motivated by ulterior motives and the unlawfulness of the, of the suspension. So... That was indeed the trigger because I announced on the 8th of June and on the 9th of June, um, I received then the letter. And Wes, will you remember also that we were awaiting the judgment of the uh, Western Cape High Court relating to part A of my um, application to also um, indicate that the president must not proceed with the suspension. So the president couldn't wait as well for the 10th of uh, uh, June for the uh, judgment of the Western Cape High Court. I would indeed uh, indicate that that is the case. Uh, I mean, yes, I mean, in, in the judgment that was, uh, I mean, as to correctly point out, given on the day you were, uh, you were suspended, the court did find that your suspension was hurried and may have been retaliatory. But Parliament had already taken the decision to institute um, a Section uh, 194 impeachment inquiry to look into um, your fitness to hold office. So it was, it was only a matter of time. And besides, the President had also already asked you to uh, provide them with reasons why you you shouldn't be suspended. Yes, um, and we will remember as well, Section 194 is very clear. It says may suspend, and the president has a discretion not to proceed with that. It's not peremptory, it's not obligatory, firstly. Secondly, um, I've been doing the work, I've been working in that office we got our clean audits, we've proceeded, irrespective of the fact that um, there was this ongoing exchange of documents, exchange of court processes. Whereas we are indeed, the president said he suspended me based on the panel report, and uh, which was indicating that there is a case for me to answer, not to say I am guilty or there is anything untoward, but then for me to come forward and explain myself. Similar applies to what um, the uh, current uh, Justice Ngogo's uh, findings was. It's just a matter of explaining yourself. There is a prima facie case. Indeed, the very same panel operated in the same way because they considered um, evidence or documents before them. And then they said for us then to uh, be sure the parliamentary process should invite uh, witnesses, should require uh, request documentary evidence so that we can determine or they can determine whether I'm incompetent, whether um, there is any misconduct on my part and I cannot be able to do my work.
Yes, but I mean, you, suspending you wasn't um, uh, suggesting or didn't mean that uh, you had been found guilty, but it was to allow for the process to, uh, uh, you know, uh, proceed unhindered and uh, so that um, you, you, you also then, uh, you know, find time to focus on it as, as, as well. Remember, I uh, have a legal team, which also, thanks to the constitutional court, which um, realized that I need to be represented and of which parliament didn't see the need for that constitutional right. And there was nothing which was going to stop me to appear before parliament whilst I'm at the office, whilst I'm still making sure that the public is protected and uh, the work is ongoing in the office because um, Buyo, I think uh, it, it was not necessary to even suspend me. And I indicated as well, six months to seven months sitting at home, um, not uh, being uh, uh, productive or being doing the work which I'm being paid for. But at any rate, it's fine because that's what this country or this parliament thinks it's fine for, for, for one to just continue. I think it was going to be for cost benefit um, uh, issues. It was not going to make any difference for me if I'm in the office because I've got the legal team. We could work, I can appear because remember it was not daily for the past six months. There was a lot of break in between where we would be able to uh, as well uh, be, I would be able to advise and guide um, the staff. So what have you been doing in, in the past six months, now other than attending, of course, the, 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 the inquiry? Uh, you know, I'm this person who's always, um, you know, um, I think you've had a lot of the staff members who, were, who testified saying I'm a hard worker. You know, I want things to be done. I've been busy uh, with... Uh, um, my own other projects, uh, you know, assisting families, but as well, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing Russian. Um, I'm studying Russian, which is keeping me busy as well, engaged so that I keep my mind uh, busy. And I think then working with the legal team to provide a lot of uh, uh, information. But then for me, um, I would have been doing a lot. And remember, Vuyo, it's, uh, I'm left with almost nine months now. And uh, in, we're starting uh, in February, basically, uh, the hearing. And uh, in February, I'll be left with a few months. And I would be then handing over and uh, making sure that my successor will be finding an office which is uh, well operational because that was my intention, especially the backlog, making sure that we don't have any backlog, matters are dealt with expediently, pay the constitution, we lead by example as much as uh, one has been uh, planning to do. Why Russian? Uh, I, I know Chinese, so because I stayed in China, so I wanted to learn a different uh, language and there was an opportunity for me uh, to, 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 to register for an online course. And I will also proceed with the French language because I also did uh, A-level a French. I will also continue doing that. Um, I love uh, languages. And I will also do Kiswahili and um, uh, uh, no languages. So I think it's just keeping my mind um, uh, uh, busy. But then Russian, it was because there was a program which was starting in, um, I think it was in September. So I said, um, basically, I think it would be good for me to just register for that. But you have no plans of going to Russia or to leave in Russia? Maybe I might go to Russia since because you started Chinese when you're st staying in <laughs> in China. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I, I feel you know the way I'm being treated by the legislature, by the judiciary, by the executive. Maybe I must consider doing that. You know, uh, but uh, no, I, I I think it's one thing which one is doing. Um, I think by the next one it will be Kiswahili because I mean. Uh, we should be this uh, um, country, or we should be individuals who would be able to converse in any other language. Talk to me about helping families. What, what, what exactly uh, do you mean by that? What do you do? 
Now, any project which the family is busy with, uh, whoever is building a house, uh, assist them, monitor their projects. I'm this person who's always wanting to have things done. So um, I'm doing that uh, basically. Nothing big um, for you, nothing complicated. Just anything. If you are uh, having uh, any project at school, kids, I'm, I'm helping. And I'm helping families, uh, not even families, um, uh, the public, because um, especially in um, uh, those who have uh, backyard gardens um, and uh, helping them to establish themselves. So that's what I'm keeping myself busy with. Of course, I mean, the, on the 5th um, uh, of this month, the, inqu the inquiry adjourned. It will resume, I think, end of January, if I'm, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Just reflecting, you know, on the life of the inquiry, inquiry so far, any particular moments that stood out for you? You know, um, I've been treated badly. Uh, what transpired is that even when I was sick um, and um, the parliamentarians proceeded with the inquiry and the uh, cross exam or questioning the witness who testified without my presence. And, um, you know, the issue of even those members of parliament proceeding to just proceed and as if nothing has happened, even a hardened criminal, I mean, if the hardened criminal is sick, a person who's murdered, a serial killer, a rapist, the court will adjourn because they recognize that that person to have rights. But then this committee didn't consider that and they just proceeded. The other worst part was when um, my legal team who had the, the, the briefing or the mandate to deal with the application for recusal uh, when they left and uh, the chairperson just proceeded and members of parliament, they even decided to proceeding without the presence of my legal team, which uh, was contrary or um, in violation of the constitutional court judgment that I must have a legal representation at all times. And it's not only their presence, but their participation, because you cannot say, no, you were sitting with your attorney, but the fact of the matter is your complete and full legal representation. Because remember, I even said to the chairperson, you know, it's like compelling me to sit here or even compelling an abused woman to sit uh, in an abusive relationship because we are not abusing you or you are told, no, we are not. Because I think they were not considering how that made me feel as a person. So I think that was the worst um, experience and uh, being uh, done by uh, uh, lawmakers of this country who should be implementing the laws of this country and who should be knowing how one should be treated. But then on the positive note, um, I think it also reflected to the South Africans that uh, what kind of a caliber of a, a, a staff which we need to have as the public protector or when you are a public protector, you should uh, be leading by example. You should be uh, 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 driven by, um, you know, outcomes driven uh, because you are receiving complaints from the public who are, have lost hope in the system because the kind of public we have, it's people who've been failed by the system. And when they come to us, we shouldn't be subjecting them to that undue delay uh, uh, and not finalize and process uh, their, their, their applications. But then I think it was also something the public should be seeing. The other worst one was when the evidence leaders were just, um, you know, displaying the legal fees of the legal teams. But then again, that was also showing South Africans that as an institution or as the executive authority, I take the issue of transformation, the issue of empowerment, very seriously and i think that was wrong terribly wrong for her to just display that not even showing that the whatever cost which were shown there the services were rendered 
and the people paid 45 percent of tax they also had, were subjected to vet so and the the time period uh, those monies were paid so i think that was also very bad but uh, but how much of that or what you regard as bad treatment uh, by the legislators had to do with what became an acrimonious rela uh, uh, relationship between your legal team, um, you know, the evidence leaders, uh, the chairperson of the, of the, of the inquiry? Remember, we are, at the beginning of the inquiry, we were very clear that we are participating, but under protest. And remember, we had court applications which um, parliament even irrespective of the court reviews applications they said we are proceeding contrary to what they have done with the current um, uh, 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 panel report of the president but they said we are proceeding uh, on issues of accountability and we said we are proceeding even the bad treatment of the chairperson several times even now the application for recusal we are proceeding we also applied for the removal of the evidence leaders because how they behaved, how they are conducting the, the inquiry themselves. Because, you know, um, we've even shown that what the prosecutor is, they, they were also say well, they are not prosecutors. Indeed, they are not prosecutors, but then they behave even, you know, uh, you know, even prosecutors sometimes they wouldn't even be behaving like that because prosecutors are also assisting the court to um, determine the truth. But then the way they are be behaving and the way they present the evidence, it's as if they would want to find fault in, um, you know, no matter at what cost. And I think we have shown um, their behavior. But at the end of the day, Vuyo, we are doing all this and we have launched the application to court for the review uh, of the, in fact, for the recusal, um, which will be had in February, again, even going to court, we would want to show and we would want to have precedence in whatever is happening um, in the country because it's the first of its kind. And we would want to make sure that my successors, whoever will come or whoever will be subjected to this particular process, they receive a process which is fully tested. And going to court, it's making sure that there's proper interpretation of whatever process which is. But do you absolve your, your, your legal team? Do you think that, um, I mean, they carried themselves well throughout this, this inquiry? Because you would have seen, I mean, the running commentary, many people actually taking issue uh, with your legal team as well. You know, Vuyo, I think the challenge is that um, remember the directives of the committee, they allow the legal team to cross-examine witnesses and cross-examination is making sure that um, whoever is testifying, it's somebody who's written their own affidavit, it's somebody who has uh, uh, evidence to whatever they are alleging. And in a number of witnesses, that has been shown. But worse, you'd find that um, the process which is followed by the members of parliament and even the chairperson, I mean, if you have a biased chairperson, unfortunately, it's worse when people will only be focusing on what the legal team has been doing, but then legal team trying to protect uh, 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 the rights of the process. Actually, they are also assisting the process that the process is, is fair. But then on a number of instances, when the legal team is asking for the chairperson to consider a certain evidence or as well querying a certain process, um, it will be turned down. In a number of instances where the chairperson as well treated the legal team, because in that uh, instance, treating uh, me as the person who's appearing before the committee. Maybe Vuyo, I think um, it should be very, um, uh, in fact, whoever is criticizing the legal team should also then be checking what transpired. Did the legal team just out of the blue started uh, possibly uh, behaving in a certain uh, manner? But from where you sit, they were faultless, they carried themselves well, or at least so far. From where I sit, um, they've carried themselves well. And I must indicate that on a number of instances, uh, not always, but in few instances, I would just tell the 
um, advocate um, Bofu SC, no, this one, just leave it, or it's not necessary to, to pursue um, whatever you want to pursue, because at the end of the day, sometimes we are just, um, we know what the outcome would be, because, um, you know, uh, yeah, I would say, uh, in some instances, I will just say, no, let it go. Or in some instances, I would be the one who's insisting that make sure that this is recorded so that, uh, because, I mean, uh, history has no blank pages. Uh, Hansard will always be there. And uh, you can also go back to the recordings and listen for yourself and hear what transpired before a certain uh, exchange or, um, you know, um, any... A, a, a thing which people might be saying it's 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 untoward um, or it's a behavior which was not uh, proper from the legal team. Just uh, I mean, for sake of clarity, what happened when uh, Advocate Mbofu uh, suggested or left the room, uh, and everyone with the impression that um, he was actually uh, walking out, you know, or walking away? Um, uh, from 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 the inquiry, what happened there? It was not a um, issue of walking out. I think if you can uh, go back to the recordings, um, the process was done, and the chairperson uh, issued uh, their uh, decision that they are not uh, granting us um, the recusal. And um, that was the only mandate. And uh, we have letters which we've written to the chairperson. We've informed the chairperson that we are only coming or they are only coming for that particular process and nothing else. I think um, that was what uh, transpired. So the uh, issue was possibly how um, it, it happened because they said we are done for a day. We are not uh, proceeding. We, we are going because... Actually, even the following day was not part of the was not one of the days was not in in the in the schedule of of the hearing. So, and remember, I requested the chairperson give me time, let me go and understand. Okay, when are we proceeding? How will we, we will we proceed? Irrespective of the fact that we are still participating under protest. Now you've, um, I mean, you, you've made your views known. You you, you repeated them um, even tonight about uh, how you feel about the inquiry and you, the, the treatment meted out to you. But also, I mean, often when whenever there have been all these um, you know court rulings um, against you, you sounded like um, a person who doesn't have. Uh, a confidence in, in our judicial system or doesn't have confidence and faith in our judicial system any anymore. Would that be a correct reading of how you feel on the back of numerous rulings um, against you? You know, maybe let's start with the issue of various court judgments and uh, very few of them, which unfortunately when they are reported in the media, it's as if we are losing all the court cases. A number of cases which um, were, I, I think there's um, statistics which we've shared showing public protector in statistics out of the cases which were taken on review. Um, I think it was only a few of those cases which were set aside, but a number of those cases relates to the complaints and the reports which we've issued and when we defend those cases, we are defending the reports and as well, as well uh, making sure that the complainants who are prejudiced by the conduct of the state are also protected and there's justice for them. Unfortunately, then you'd find that when the matter goes to court, the focus is on the process and, um, and how we've investigated. And you find that uh, we did that uh, in good faith because we wanted to protect uh, that particular person. Uh, there are a number of judgments for you. I think when I am uh, testifying, I will also show a number of uh, gaps and uh, a number of judgments where, uh, unfortunately, the judges have also erred in, in, in coming to a certain conclusion. 
so unfortunate that some of them I would appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal, they will consider the papers and they will decide there is no prospect of success, even the constitutional court also not listening to um, our arguments. Some of the judgments, indeed, I, I, I've lost confidence in, 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 in some of the judges, not the justice system per se. And hence, I'll continue to take matters to court because um, I'm still repeating, whatever judgments is issued, um, it's recorded in the history books. And as well, those judges, when um, time comes, and when somebody else is uh, also facing the same thing, I think there must be justice, there must be fairness. So there are judgments which are unfair. And Vuyo, I mean, being the best public protector to be clobbered with the personal costs when I was doing my work and uh, uh, you know the best, I know how there was no ulterior motive and I had to pay personal costs, which uh, the public, thanks to them again, they managed to raise funds and they paid those uh, personal costs. So there are still those who are, which were pending. I think there was a stage where Justice Matlanga even said, you know, people, it's now fashionable for uh, lower courts, especially high courts, to just um, agree to personal costs. I mean, the West one is recently at the Constitutional Court as well, where the um, legal team of the president and the legal team of um, the DA we're still saying I must pay personal costs. Um, why am I always taking the matters to court? I think uh, the issue is I'm not litigating maliciously or frivolously or in bad faith, but I just want justice to be done. All that said, do you still have faith and confidence in our judicial system? Yes, no? Uh, I would say, um, you know, I in the justice system, I have faith, but not in certain or individuals because judges are fallible. Judges also, they do commit mistakes. Um, I, unfortunately, sometimes I'm being treated or being labeled as, as this person who is um, problematic, but Forgetting as well that I've got legal teams which represent me, which also advise and sometimes would want certain legal, um, you know, prescripts to be tested. So I would say, uh, hence I'll always go back, um, hoping for the best uh, in, the, in the long run. Uh, but if not, and remember, Vuyo, there were instances also where I showed to the public um, and the world at large that certain judgments were discussed and uh, media people uh, would know about them, this Abramje, before even we know. And the judgment comes out and indeed it's against me. So how then do you have confidence in instances like those? So it's not a, a gen well, um, I can't generalize. I would say there would be people who, or there would be judges who honestly focus on the facts and be objective. Uh, hence, we have this uh, Western Cape High Court judgment, which was dealing with what transpired and nothing more, nothing less. Alukan Kwawana, thanks very much for your time this evening. Thank you, Vuyo, and I would want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year and uh, all the best uh, to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Advocate Busuam Kweban, suspended um, public protector, reflecting on what was quite an eventful year um, for her. I mean, of course, facing uh, that inquiry into her fitness to hold office, suspended, uh, but also um, going through quite a number of uh, court cases. That's our show for tonight. To join us again tomorrow evening, same time. Have a good night.